This is Charles Denham, and I am uh, very pleased to uh, uh, to uh, initiate our uh, 123rd webinar today. Uh, we are uh, covering a topic from burnout to esprit de corps, uh, which I think uh, will be a, a terrific, uh, a terrific program. And uh, we have a, kind of a new uh, uh, slide advancement methodology. And Kyle, if you could help me advance the slides, I have a different uh, dashboard here today. Kyle, could you please do that for me? And maybe come on and, uh, oh, I think I, there we go. And my name is Charles Denham. I uh, will be the MC today and be coordinating our discussion. Uh, what I first need to do is just to address a couple of housekeeping details. One is to make sure that your, uh, your volume is all the way up on the speakers of your computer, that the WebEx volume is all the way up. And if you are using external speakers, to have that volume all the way up. Now, in the event that that does not help you, and, I, and I'm on slide four, uh, please go to uh, the participants uh, window and then click on request phone and button and you'll receive a, a, a toll dial in and then you can have a landline if your audio is not satisfactory. For those that have the slides, I'm on slide five. For those that don't, uh, please go to www.safetyleaders.org and go to the What's New upcoming events in the upper right quadrant of the screen and you'll find today's webinar and click there for details and you'll be able to download the slides. For those that are watching this uh, video uh, uh, um, on demand at a future date. Uh, you can use the same mechanism to go and get resources and on slide six of the slides, you'll see uh, where you would land to go and watch uh, the video. If we have further resources that might become available, we'll post them on this web page, which can be found going through the webinars tab. If you wish to follow us on Twitter or uh, other social media, the uh, addresses are on uh, slide seven. And our purpose statement is, our purpose is that we will measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families, patients, and caregivers. And this topic today is, is apropos to that. Our mission is to accelerate performance solutions that save lives, save money, and create value in the communities that we serve and projects we undertake. Uh, our disclosure statements are on uh, slide nine. No, no product, service, or technology, pharmaceutical device, or service product will be discussed uh, in any way. I'll However, the full disclosures are on slide uh, number nine. And uh, our speakers today will be Dr. Steven Swenson uh, uh, from uh, the Mayo Clinic, recently retired and now a, a global champion uh, for tackling the issue of burnout. Alicia Ko uh, Kowalski, who I'll introduce uh, shortly, who's a professor at the University of Texas and uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, and Dan Ford, who's been a longtime patient safety leader and champion and, uh, and uh, just a steadfast participant in uh, the great work in patient safety that so many of you have undertaken. And most noteworthy probably is the fact that the published results now for the hospital acquired conditions show that more than $2.9 billion were saved and 8,000 lives saved. And uh, Dan was part of the core team that helped get that uh, program across the goal line. And uh, we're so grateful to have Dan kind of open us today. Hopefully, Dan, we have you on audio and you can just uh, give us a, a short inspirational uh, statement to get us uh, focused on the true north of what we want to cover today. I appreciate uh, the introduction, Chuck, and yes, I am here, and I appreciate uh, uh, being able to participate once again. I'd like to welcome those who are online, the online audience, as well as our faculty. Um, important subject, uh, both aspects of this, and they are clearly related. And I, frankly, I've known Steve for a number of years, and I can't wait to um, hear what you have to say, Steve, and uh, to be able to respond in some form uh, at some point. Uh, again, thank you and welcome to everybody. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, so now what I'm going to do is go through a rapid uh, news update and recap of our prior two webinars, actually both January and, uh, and December in terms of our survey uh, results. And then we'll get right to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Swenson's presentation and our wonderful reactors. Uh, first off, the MedTAC program, which we uh, started about three years ago, uh, now has its second uh, uh, campus safety magazine article, and that one is addressing active shooter events in uh, healthcare institutions. 
tackling the eight leading causes of death of children, young adults, and, uh, and working adults. Uh, we've been collaborating with uh, Mayo Clinic, with uh, the Harvard Affiliated Hospitals, MD Anderson, a great partner of this program, and uh, have the program actually now launched in California, Florida, Texas, Hawaii, and soon we'll be starting a program in Rochester, Minnesota. The, over to the lower right-hand corner is the article that was just released, and it's regarding uh, patient safety, or regarding the uh, advanced uh, uh, active shooter events in hospitals. The article that was released in December, the December issue of Campus Safety Magazine, you see before you, uh, including the care packs that, and the program that uh, programs that we've started in schools have taught the program now at Stanford University. We'll be soon teaching at uh, at Harvard University this spring, and have ongoing programs at MD Anderson where Dr. Kowalski is. The article that uh, will be posted so you can download a PDF is a review article of the active shooter response at a healthcare facility article in the New England Journal of Medicine that was released. Uh, and the, the, this review article that we wrote was uh, targeting university uh, safety and quality leaders, campus leaders, hospital leaders, uh, and added to, uh, to the review of the New England Journal article addressing the unique characteristics of healthcare facilities and why, um, why secure, preserve, fight might be a better alternative if, uh, if run, hide, fight uh, is not possible for our caregivers. And uh, so I won't belabor it anymore, but the article will be posted there. Uh, the other thing to bring up is, is that now after, uh, now, uh, uh, after the anniversary of the uh, Parkland shooting, one reminder, we want to remind everybody, everybody uh, talks about the negative things that happened, but uh, there is a wonderful Medscape video review of what happened in 17 uh, individuals had tourniquets or chest seals or both uh, already uh, treating them by the time the EMS were able to get to the victims. So bystander care was really excellent at that, at that location. Not that it could not have been better, but it's important to know that. Another thing that popped up in the news on the 18th of January was uh, this continued issue of uh, challenges that we face in terms of workplace violence for our nurses and the story of a nurse who was stabbed multiple times by a patient. We're, we're really looking and we're working closely with Chief Adcox at, uh, at MD Anderson, uh, where Dr. Kowalski is regarding what are the leading edge approaches that we could take to protect our caregivers who are on the job? Uh, we're covering burnout today, but this as the safety risk and, uh, uh, and the workplace violence is so enormous. The other, uh, the other story that uh, everyone is following are the Johns Hopkins uh, story of uh, their multiple sites having uh, enormous patient safety problems. And I think this it really illustrates that when you do have a problem and then the press gets a hold of it, Good press, bad press, whatever kind of press, you're going to have press, and it's absolutely critical that an organization really uh, learns from these cases. So this case of Johns Hopkins continues to evolve. They must have a very large team of investigative reporters that are addressing the many uh, issues in patient safety. So we're just updating that. And in the slide deck, you can go to the articles. So uh, we were asked to provide the list of the articles. Now they, about every six or seven days, another article is coming out by uh, the Tampa Bay Times. Uh, they appear to be balanced, they're, they're thoughtful. And I think the lesson here is we need to learn from uh, the lessons of uh, other organizations on what we can do after bad events occur, which was a very important topic that you as an audience told us we need more on what to do, how to manage adverse events and uh, what to do with them. A reminder of what happened at Memorial Sloan Kettering, same kind of issue, and we talk about threats um, to our organizations, those we serve, those who uh, serve, uh, though, and the physical and virtual property represented by an organization. Memorial Sloan Kettering had a terrible uh, problem with disclosure of financial issues. This letter that you see on slide 26 was sent to the majority of major medical centers regarding the issue of the failure to disclose financial uh, issues. And this can be so disruptive to programs like patient safety and others that rely on philanthropy funding that then shuts off when uh, there are these kinds of scandals. And then the final thing was, is this issue of the, uh, the Healthcare Innocence Project we're participating in to really address what can happen when nurses, doctors, pharmacists can be falsely accused or be made to be the scapegoat when a system failure occurs and uh, the protections that they need. Uh, so 
Now, a quick recap. So those are some of the topics that are in the news other than those that are regarding burnout. So we're right on time, 10 minutes after the hour. We will review uh, our survey results from the prior two webinars and then introduce Dr. Uh, Swenson's presentation with some of what's been in the news on burnout. Uh, Jim Conway did a fabulous job in December addressing uh, how to respond to adverse events. 39% uh, of you gave it a 10 that you wanted more. Uh, we've engaged uh, Tom Vanderwark, formerly the uh, board chair of Virginia Mason, when Virginia Mason won the LeapFrog Award for being, uh, the, best, uh, being the, the most uh, uh, um, recognized hospital in, in, in America. Tom will be talking about how to respond to adverse events and why the board needs to know and what structures and systems might need to be in place uh, to be able to really uh, address these issues and avoid uh, the scandalous things that can be interpreted by outsiders as cover-up or other things that may or may not have happened. But uh, you all have told us that you want to have more uh, on slide 30, and I won't read them. A lot of the topics that you want covered regarding the response to adverse events are both clinical as well as administrative. And I think that in 2019, we'll have more than one on responding to adverse events and learning from them. So on slide uh, 31, uh, you, see, uh, uh, you see the topics, but you also see sepsis over and over and over again. And um, that's why uh, we uh, had uh, Casey Clemens, who did a fabulous job in January addressing the sepsis issues. The results of the survey of you as an audience were, uh, we asked, did you want another webinar on sepsis? And 60% gave it a 10, 94% agreed, 79% strongly. So you can count on more sepsis uh, in 2019. And uh, it's amazing, We uh, last year and the year before, we did at least two, uh, set two programs on sepsis, and this com continues to be a very daunting problem. And so we'll have at least one more or two this year to address it. The topics that you wanted to have addressed are on slide 34. We'll use that as an input to the design of bringing back more leaders on sepsis. And we may ask uh, um, uh, our combined presentations on mortality review to also address sepsis. Then we ask about the ask you uh, uh, whether you wanted to start a MedTech bystander care program, and you can see kind of more of a bell curve. And we're reaching out to those of you that want to have uh, uh, some support to help start a program. These are entirely free programs that we're helping sponsor at schools, uh, churches, and scout groups. We ask you, uh, did you want more information on the conflict of interest in academic fraud? Not a big response. We won't be doing a full session on it. We'll just be tracking um, these, uh, these topics uh, for you, but we won't do a full topic uh, on it. However, a uh, full webinar on it. However, th slide 39 addressed the, er the areas that the people that are really interested in it would like to be addressed, which we'll continue to kind of monitor in, uh, in the press. So now let's shift to uh, burnout. So uh, January 17th uh, from the, the School of Public Health and, the, and, and uh, Steve will have you help uh, and Alicia inter interpret these multiple surveys that are, have been out there. But uh, we're now seeing in the press over and over and over again more issues regarding the recognition of burnout. And this, this one, the 2018 survey, 78% of physicians surveyed uh, experienced the symptoms. AMA, uh, uh, its report January 24th. Here's a breakdown, and again, I'm not going to read the slides. I just want to uh, set them up, Steve, for you uh, and Alicia to discuss as we look at that topic and how we define it. And, and uh, but there's no question it's a daunting problem. No question that it's a problem that contributes to patient safety. Uh, and uh, we can see on, on this slide kind of a bit of a breakdown on the lower right hand side um, regarding the specialties. 60% respondents chose too many bureaucratic tasks, such as charting and paperwork as a crit critical issue. We're also seeing the EHR uh, being uh, uh, critical. And we've added more detailed slides from these articles in our resources section, which I'm not going to go through today. Steve, in the medical economics, it addresses the Mayo proceedings, 54.4%. I know you'll probably uh, tackle this, but also they highlighted in the medical economics loss of autonomy, and erosion in the belief that everyone in the healthcare industry is, is acting in the best interest of patients. Uh, Medscape um, also uh, published the, the Depression and Suicide Report 2019 uh, and addressed 
again, these are a lot of different numbers, and I'm sure Steve, you can allow help us uh, to know how to interpret uh, these various surveys and reports. But there's no question that it's picking up steam. It's getting a lot of press attention, and we've added this just as kind of a context um, uh, as well. Uh, what would reduce your burnout and how do physicians cope with it are on uh, uh, slide 45, and uh, uh, they address some of these uh, topics on slide uh, 46. And again, more detail in the resources section. Uh, does your workplace offer a program to reduce stress and burnout? And, uh, and then uh, do physicians use the workplace uh, program? So um, this kind of gives you a little bit of a picture of what Medscape uh, has provided and more detail uh, from there. So uh, it's just been a really great pleasure and, and I'm right at 15 minutes, so I'm, I'm glad I can now turn it over to the experts, but just wanted to let you all see what was in the press. Um, known Dr. Steve Swenson for years. Uh, there isn't anybody I, I, I more admire than Steve. He's, he's uh, been, uh, he's really motivated us in this topic in healthcare leadership and professional burnout. However, uh, he has been uh, at the Mayo Clinic. He was the uh, chairman of radiology. He uh, acted as the director for leadership and organizational development and co-led the professional burnout initiative for 4,100 uh, uh, 4, physicians and scientists, 232 title leaders. He was the director of, qual of quality, and that's how we got to know each other, established the Quality Academy and the Value Creation System. Uh, and more than 37,000 colleagues were certified as quality fellows during his tenure there. Um, he has uh, had uh, multiple uh, federal grants for his work uh, in, uh, in imaging, he has written multiple books. He's a full professor. Now, um, he is a, a professor emeritus at the Mayo Clinic, and as, as, I can, uh, uh, as far as I can tell, has not slowed down a bit. Steve, you're just a wonderful contributor to healthcare globally, and uh, we're really honored to have you uh, address from burnout to esprit de corps. Steve is, uh, has a new book that will be coming out this year, and we want you to tell us about when that will be coming out. Steve? Chuck, thank you so much. Chuck, you're my favorite servant leader, and I know no human being with a bigger heart. It's an honor to be part of your webinar program today. The opportunity we have with professional burnout is staggering, and I actually think it's maybe better to frame it as professional distress, because burnout is so narrow. It's, it's, it's a measure of cynicism, and depersonalization or being callous. It's a measure of social isolation and a loss of confidence in your ability. But the professional distress that affects healthcare providers, nurses, MPPAs, and physicians goes beyond that to include uh, moral injury, post traumatic stress disorder, compassion fatigue, clinical depression, suicidal ideation, and the reason this fits so nicely with the theme of this webinar series at TMIT is that it is a patient safety issue. It's a patient quality issue. It's a patient experience issue. It's a patient cost issue. And there's this vicious cycle where though issues with falling short of the best possible care and experience for patients comes back as a driver of professional burnout. And so as the major root cause in a broad sense of professional distress, it's shortfalls in quality and a corrosion of this connection to meaning and purpose that brings all of us to healthcare to start with. So the dialogue we'll have today starts with this theme of reconnecting to the meaning and purpose of our work and we want to care for each other for our patients. 1978, I was in uh, medical school in Madison, Wisconsin, and I met Sam. Uh, we were in our anatomy lab together and shared a, a, a cadaver that was graciously donated to the university. Sam, it was clear from the first time I met him, it was going to be a fabulous physician. His line, time and time again, as a student, as a resident, as a colleague, was how can I help you? To patients, to colleagues, to professors, to families, how can I help you? And he was a wonderful physician. Um, 
And over the years, the system designed to squeeze out the vitality and enthusiasm of a healthcare professional took its toll. He was on a production model that made his colleagues and other doctors competitors instead of collaborators. He was swapped with clerical work that was not necessary, that was redundant, that, that disconnected to the meaning and purpose of his work. He was in an environment where there wasn't psychological safety among the leaders. He was involved in adverse events as any healthcare professional is, and that further dripped acid on the meaning and purpose of his, of his uh, work. He was involved in a malpractice suit, which a large proportion of physicians are. It was later dropped, but the effect on his morale and spirit lasted, and eventually, from all of these drivers, left the profession. And he's worse off for it, his family is, his patient certainly is, and our profession is because we didn't take care of Sam. It doesn't have to be that way. So this is, in stark contrast, um, a group of people that have esprit de corps. Esprit de corps is a French term for spirit of the body. It is the fulfillment, engagement, satisfaction, joy, camaraderie, loyalty, passion that we all dream of having in this calling of medicine. Here, these are a group of uh, folks at Mayo Clinic that um, work in the basement levels with no natural light, except for their supervisor in the red on the left, Mary Molko. Uh, all of them make less than $75,000, including benefits. All of them, um, they, they, what, they, what their day is is sterilizing endoscopes, and laundry and making sure there's a supply of safe materials for all parts of the hospital that they work in. And there, if you see across the top, that's a picture I took of their whiteboard. It says, people are alive. These folks, um, most of them at entry level, this is an entry level job at Mayo, um, are connected to the meaning and purpose of their work because they know and they said and they believe that uh, by doing their work well that people are alive. So they have meaning and purpose, they have camaraderie of this group where Mary gets them together regularly for lunches, they celebrate birthdays and uh, positive events in their families, they celebrate when someone gets a promotion out of there and they have a little alumni reunion. So this group should probably have among the lowest rates of satisfaction and fulfillment and engagement at Mayo by some standards and highest rate of burnouts and their numbers are just the opposite of what you expect because they've connected to, they have agency, they have coherence and they have camaraderie. And I'll we'll spend a little more time on that in just a minute. So this work basically starts with uh, the patient. Everything we do um, to address professional burnout should be seen through the patients, the family, and the community eyes and move forward. It's very much like the, the quality movement a generation ago. In the early 90s, there was not much awareness of the shortfalls in, in quality and safety and experience in this country. And there was not an understanding that there was a business case for it and there weren't good measures for it. And now, um, as represented by all of you, uh, colleagues and folks listening today, um, there's a widespread understanding that there's a gap between the care we want to give and the care that we're actually delivering. It's true for professional distress. It, the, we're gaining awareness, we have good measures, and now we're learning what we can do to reduce it dramatically, much like we did with quality over the last generation. So we start with the patient. In order to have our organization thrive, we have to have engaged, joyful colleagues with esprit de corps. And, um, and for the organization to uh, make a difference for caregivers and, of course, for patients and families, senior leadership needs to understand uh, the business case for this, the moral imperative for it, and ideally it happens before there's a uh, suicide of a nurse or a doctor or a caregiver which would be the tragic case. 
in order, like for the quality, we have to have measures to know where we're at, how we compare to others, and if we're making improvements. And so there are three measures that um, I think are core to helping us make progress for our patients with the engagement, the joy, the satisfaction, the esprit de corps of our staff. One is to measure um, the levels of burnout, engagement, satisfaction at the unit level. The second is to measure five behaviors of leaders of, throughout the organization. And the third is a couple of leading indicators of practice efficiency related to the electronic health record. And we'll get into details about that uh, shortly. So the, 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 then with those measures to, as a guide for assessing our improvement, we need to co-create ideal work environment with agency coherence and camaraderie. More about that in just a moment. And that co-creation of ideal work is intended to do one of two things, to either increase the positivity of the work environment or decrease the negativity. And we know from work with Professor Lasada, Professor Fredrickson, that basically highly functioning teams need to have a ratio of five to six positive to negative for them to flourish. And so the, the esprit de corps work is geared at getting rid of the negativity and increasing the positivity. Same thing is true for marriages and long-term relationships. The, the marriages that last the longest, the relationships that long, have the longest, have about the same ratio of five to six to one, positive to negative. You have to address all the opportunities for improvement and the challenges, but if the spirit of the relationship of the team or the marriage or friendship is one of first starting and acknowledging the app, affirming what's good and appreciating the things that were intended to be done well, um, you end up with highly functioning teams and relationships. And of course, then that gets us to esprit de corps uh, for the caregivers, which is, I'll submit to you, the most important and impactful leading indicator over which we have control, the leading indicator of patient outcome, safety, service, experience, and patient costs. And we'll get into more details in that later. But this links so inextricably with what we want for uh, this calling to medicine and healthcare. What I'll share with you are five specific tactics. They're evidence-based, they're validated, they work to improve esprit de corps, to drive out professional distress, and we'll get into each of these. Ask us empower the prone test, job crafting, commonality, and five leader behaviors over the next uh, 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 handful of minutes. It took me 24 years to figure this out, but when I look back over the last uh, uh, couple decades uh, at Mayo Clinic in my leadership roles, started leading a large department. And I just got back from Carnegie Mellon, got a master's degree out there, learned all about quality, and so we used rapid cycle improvement and Lean Six Sigma and, and other quality and listening modes to uh, improve the reliability of our care. It worked to improve the reliability and it saved us money. As director for quality at Mayo of our 22 hospitals, we use the same uh, co-creation of ideal work that I'll share with you shortly to improve psychological safety of our caregivers close to the patient. It worked for that and it also had some financial and reliability dividends at the same time. The last eight years, Mayo Clinic's physician led, all the physicians still practice, um, and we rotate. So the, the third uh, uh, leadership position I had for the last of the three eight-year terms was medical director for leadership and organization development. And we used the same co-creation of ideal work through the eyes of doctors, nurses, social workers, MPPAs, you know, the people closest to the patient doing the work of healthcare. We used it to improve this re decor to eradicate burnout and professional distress, and it worked for that. And I'll show you the peer-reviewed studies that we published showing that. It also served as a good leadership development tool and had the other financial and reliability dividends. So it, it, it's uh, uh, the, the processes of participative management, collaborative action planning that I'll share with you 
have dividends for all the things that matter to us, that matter to patients, the families, and the communities that we have the privilege of serving. And the schema then is this of co-creation of ideal work is centered on this intervention triad of agency, coherence, and camaraderie. And so agency is, the, is this capacity to act independently as an individual and as a team. It's a basic human need to have some control over your life as long as it creates value for patients. And, and so this agency, there are two of these specific tactics, the pronoun test and job crafting, that give healthcare providers within the guardrails of the best possible patient care, um, gives them some control over their lives, gives them some capacity to act you know, independently. And so maybe a decade ago, I got a chance to meet Mohamed Yanis after he was awarded the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. We had a Mayo Clinic to learn how we, what we could learn from him as a Nobel Prize winner. And the beauty of what he did for his Nobel Prize, he started the Grameen Bank. And it was all about helping the poorest of the poor in Bangladesh. Not doing something to them or for them, but doing something with them. He, he instead of giving handouts to the poorest of the poor, he gave them loans to the Grameen Bank. And, the, the, and they, he did the opposite of what the Western world of banking does. He gave loans to the poorest of the poor. He gave loans to women instead of men. And instead of having the bankers with these fancy buildings that saw their, the people who got the loans, when they got the loan and when they closed the loan, the bankers, quote unquote, walked through the streets and helped these women who used the loan to buy a loom or to buy a barbecue, something where they could do something to help themselves succeed. And so the spirit of this is how in healthcare we should deal with patients to do something with them instead of to them or for them. And it works perfectly for the relationship that leaders and organizations should have with the healthcare professionals, the clinicians doing the work of healthcare. So instead of telling them what to do and doing something for them, it's doing something with them. It's the spirit of participative management and giving them the agency where it makes sense for the best patient care to make their decisions um, themselves. One way to measure this is with the pronoun test. Robert Reich is a former labor secretary. He measures the vitality and the effectiveness and the um, capacity of an organization to flourish by the pronouns that the people of the organization use to talk about the leadership. And if, it, if, the, if the doctors and nurses and social workers and other clinicians talk about your organization with the pronouns they and them, it's set up to, to flounder. If the doctors, nurses, social workers, clinicians, managers talk about the leadership of their organization as us, and we and ours, that organization is set up to flourish, the pronoun test. And so what we want to do then is through our leadership systems and behaviors, change the pronouns from them to us and from me to we. So the focus is less on the dichotomy between someone else telling us to do and it's more on the team of we than the individuals of me. And as the pronoun test moves in the right direction, we move from competition to cooperation and collaboration, and we move from this trust to social capital, which is a fancy word for the trust and interconnectedness of the people of the organization. And there are a lot of ways to do that, but if we, if we engage with clinicians, doctors, as cost centers or revenue centers, well then they behave that way. If we engage with them as partners and architects, then we get a different result than if we treat them as carpenters. 
just telling them what to do. So I got a chance to meet uh, Michael Bush last year. He's the president and CEO of Best Places to Work. Three decades of study on the best places to work, he distilled into one sentence. He said, the root of the tree is trust. And so as we move the pronouns to they and them, to us and we, that's a sign that trust is growing in our organization and we're set up to flourish. This is Brad Leva. She's the chair of urology at Mayo Clinic. When he took over, the urology had uh, among the top 10 burnout rates of any work unit across um, the whole organization of 65,000 caregivers. And he flipped those numbers within 18 months. He did it by basically um, giving his staff agency, the capacity to act independently. He said his, the spirit of his leadership was a thin rule book and wide guardrail. Instead of telling the, the staff, this is how we should do it, here's the answer, um, the management team at Mayo Clinic told us what to do, we just need to do it. He said, I'm not going to be a middle manager. I'm going to be a leader. So instead of telling the team what to do or telling them that the leadership of Mayo Clinic is telling us what to do, we're going to figure out what's the best thing to do for patients, what's the best thing to do for the integrative practice at Mayo by looking at the outcomes that the practice needs, and then we can figure out with our agency what needs to be done. And that was all he did. He said, we're going to co-create this together. Everybody's going to figure it out. I don't have the answers alone. Together we do. And the numbers flipped basically by giving them the agency to take control over their work environment. Turns out that human beings working in organizations from factories to healthcare centers actually live longer if instead of telling them, this is the road you have to take, here's the policy, here's the procedure, here's what you need to do, they live longer and they flourish and the organization does better for patients. If instead we say, we just need to get to this summit, you figure out or together we'll figure out how we get to that summit instead of telling them what the answer is, even if we know it. And usually we don't without a collective participative management approach. It makes a big difference for patients. So Professor Eichen at uh, Penn studied this for over a decade and showed that nurses, um, when, they, when they said that they felt like they had some input in the, the, the decisions that affected their practice and their patients, that their patients had better outcomes, better experience, better safety outcomes, better quality outcomes, simply by, because the nurses felt that they were, had agency to be part of the team. So that's the first of those five tactics. Uh, one of the old traditions that the Institute for Healthcare Improvement that Dr. Berwick started a couple of decades ago is um, to ask ourselves, what can we do by next Tuesday? So we're busy now, uh, we've got a weekend coming up, but is there something that we could do in our own leadership style or something that we could do um, with our team or uh, that would give them more agency to look at outcomes instead of being told what the processes are? Could we give someone in our relationship wide guardrails in a thin rule book and have them flourish as a member of our team? So Annie Dillard said, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. An important part of this agency piece is a space called job crafting, and it relates to how we spend our days. So it turns out, we studied this at Mayo Clinic, that for every, um, we, we, if, if we ask professionals, caring for patients, what is the most meaningful part of their work day? It might be 
teaching, it might be quality improvement work, it might be seeing a patient and family that has advanced diabetes, it might be uh, working on a committee to figure out the best way to improve the workflow or policy. Whatever it is that's most meaningful to that professional, if they, for every 1% more that they spend doing what's most meaningful to them, there's a measurable decrease in professional burnout. And in fact, when at 20% of their times doing work that's most meaningful to them, they have half the rates of burnout as other professionals that don't. So job crafting is a way for us to ask each other and ourselves what is most meaningful in our work. Is it something to do with our relationships? Is it something to do with working across boundaries to connect to a different part of the organization? Is it just our mental model of how we approach our job? And, and so either by our own actions or working with the leader to whom we report, we can shift our job experience, relationship, boundaries, or approach to it. It's called job crafting, and it makes a big difference in our uh, professional burnout and distress. In the picture here is, is the Christina Rodriguez. She is a environmental services professional. She's a custodian. She cleans rooms, sanitizes doorknobs, change sheets. Her job description says that. She does her job description, but her, she has job crafted her work to expand to caring for patients. So at every opportunity when she is doing her environmental service work, she looks to support families and patients with conversations and hugs. And basically, as we do this, we make ourselves immune to professional distress by either formal or informal job crafting. This is an important part of agency, and it doesn't cost any time. But it connects us to the meaning and purpose of our work. And Dr. Berwick you know, summarized this nicely as that being the true source of our joy and work. So we, we should ask ourselves what it is that's most meaningful to us, and then working either on our own with our team or with our group leader or manager, how can I do at least 20% of my time, if not more, to, um, to do something that's more meaningful and uh, bring back joy and work? Gallup has surveyed over 10 million people, 155 different countries. The number one cause of happiness is meaningful work. And job crafting can get us going that, in that direction. Most of us in healthcare, in leadership and management, as a doctor, nurse, social worker, pharmacist, um, came because we had a relationship with our work that Professor Bella would call a calling, where the motivation is intrinsic and we come more for that purpose and meeting than we do for a paycheck, even though we need the paycheck to pay the rent. The other category of a relationship to our work is one of a career where we get rewards from recognition and accomplishment and, and progress. And the third relationship is one of where our job is simply work. It's an extrinsic motivation and an extrinsic reward. We get a paycheck, but we don't find a lot of meaning and purpose in our work. So this job crafting is an opportunity for us to move on that spectrum from our job being just work to our job just being a career to getting back to what brought us, most of us, into healthcare is the meaning and purpose of this calling to help patients, families, in communities, and we have some control over that. We have some agency to job craft and to look at asking others to co-create uh, our jobs and best work environment instead of having someone else do it for us. So is there something that you could do by next Tuesday? Is there something, what is it that's most meaningful to you in your work? 
and is there a way that you could informally across boundaries or relationships or just your mental model increase the amount of time that you're doing something that's most meaningful or could you work with your boss the leader to report is there something you could do to job craft or to uh, improve your agency to take, act independently as in the best interest of the patient as an individual or a team. So the second area then is coherence. And coherence is, uh, is this natural healthy tension between agency to act independently and coherence to be part of this beautiful orchestra that has a single vocal cord where acting independently is, uh, is less uh, vital. And, and, and so you can't, if everyone had their own music and script without a conductor and without the intention of being coherent in an integrated healthcare system, patients and families wouldn't do as well. So we need to look at opportunities for coherence where all parts of the clinic, the nursing home, the hospital, the medical staff, the leadership, all of them work together and fit comfortably in a united whole. And, and that's, so coherence is vital for us to uh, thrive. And there are two tactics, the five behaviors and ask, listen, and power that I'll share with you now that are evidence-based and validated means of helping us be part of this coherent delivery system and teams that make this helps us be part of something bigger than ourselves that we can't do if we just lived on agency alone. So this is where the organization has an opportunity to make you a better clinician or manager by being part of this orchestra. So these five leader behaviors are uh, one means to do that. Uh, when I was head of leadership development at Mayo a decade ago, we started measuring five behaviors of leaders, recognize, inquire, inform, develop, include, on an annual staff survey of all 65,000 Mayo Clinic caregivers. And for every point upwards on that 60-point scale, these are questions that every staff member ad answers about their, the leader to whom they report. For every point upwards, there was a 9% increase in esprit de corps, satisfaction, engagement, fulfillment, loyalty, camaraderie, passion. And for every point upwards on those leader behaviors for your immediate boss or manager or leader, there was a 3.3% reduction in professional burnout. We know this works, we managed to it, we developed to it, and we slept for it because it makes a difference for patients. The five behaviors are simple. They're common sense, they're just not common practice. Appreciation, behavior number one. Thank you for your work on the team today. Behavior number two, I'm interested in your ideas. Tell me what you think we should do. Let's figure this out together. Number three, back to Michael Bush, trust, transparency. Does my leader communicate transparently? That's one of the most powerful ways to build trust is to open the books and say, let's figure out the best way forward together. I don't have the LE answers. Here's all the data. I'm not keeping it going. Let's co-create this together. The fourth behavior, I'm interested in your career. What do you want to be doing five years from now at our organization? We want to keep you here. We want to have your job be ideal. Let's figure out your dream plan at our organization and see if we can achieve that together. And the fifth behavior is everybody on the team feels included. And so leaders and team members have to be very conscious of unconscious biases, of biases that aren't unconscious, and work to eliminate them or manage them. All of us have unconscious biases, and that's why for orchestras, the best orchestras get the best musicians by blind auditions, where the, the, the violinist who's trying for, to be join the orchestra 
tries comes to a audition below behind a curtain so the conductor and the team can't see what they look like, what they're wearing, what their gender is, and they get better musicians because they eliminate the unconscious biases of being more comfortable with someone who looks and um, behaves and talks like you. So those are the five behaviors. They make a difference. We manage to them. And when, when I was head of leadership development, we kept track of them for every uh, uh, physician leader, which was 242 title physicians leaders. And it works so well that now Mayo is using it for all 3,300 point of care leaders. They get um, a leader index uh, every year from the annual staff survey, and we share that with the leaders and help them get better. So here's the bell curve of all of the physician leaders at Mayo when I was doing this. And uh, the ones on the left needed help with those five behaviors. We coached them, we developed them, almost all of them got better, but they didn't get better because they didn't want to or they couldn't. We moved them out of their leadership position because they were hurting patients. So I got a chance to hear uh, Robert Wood, Bob Woodward speak uh, a few weeks ago, and he, he, he was the investigative reporter that, that opened up uh, uh, Watergate. And his boss at the Washington Post, Catherine Graham, told him um, as they were getting famous for Watergate, they said, he said, she said, beware the demon pomposity. And I was thinking as I heard him speaking that basically these five behaviors of appreciation and participative management, in transparent communication, interest in your career and inclusion, is it, basically you can't be pompous if you are really living those five behaviors. When you survey people across the planet and look for the single statement that is most strongly linked to staff deciding they want to stay, their productivity, their loyalty, their discretionary effort, it's this one statement that my supervisor cares about me as a person. If you live those five behaviors, that's what your staff will say about you and your organization will be set up to flourish. I ran across a study the other day. This is a voodoo doll, and voodoo doesn't work, at least as far as inflicting harm on your boss. But if your boss isn't behaving like that and is frustrating and making your life miserable, well, that boss needs to be replaced. But in the interim, before they replace the boss, here's some research out of Canada that shows that if you take a voodoo doll, pretend it's your boss, stick a needle in it, uh, light a match to it, use a uh, pliers to, uh, to uh, uh, um, squeeze one of its arms, you'll actually feel better. So the first thing organizations need to do is to get good leaders who live those five behaviors, and while they're replacing a leader who is a bully or malignant or doesn't care about you, get out your voodoo doll for a couple weeks uh, and then um, move on when the organization does the right thing by getting a leader who helps you and your team give the best possible care to patients. So at Mayo, we kept track of all of our leadership positions. They all had succession pools. And we measured leadership indexes on them. We looked at succession pools that we measured for readiness and ethnic diversity and gender diversity because we wanted the best possible leaders for our patients. One of the things we measured was emotional intelligence. Um, here's a, a fun, not terribly sophisticated study out of, uh, out of, uh, out of England. And what they did there was they um, uh, did one thing to increase the milk productivity of a cow by 88 gallons. They gave the cow a name, and they used that name. And guess what? The cows produce more milk. And the same thing happens for human beings. If we treat people with respect, if we give them a name, if we... Uh, relate to them with empathy and concern and compassion, there are lower rates of burnout, higher rates of well-being, satisfaction, productivity, engagement, patient outcomes, and team effectiveness. It's a measure of emotional intelligence. And so we 
measured emotional intelligence of all of our staff before we hired them, and we it's possible to increase your emotional intelligence. So we have programs to do that because it made a difference for the team and their low rates of burnout if your leader and your teammates have high levels of EQ. So we selected for it, we developed for it because it made a difference for our staff and for our patients. Leaders matter. So is there something you could do by next Tuesday? Are there one of those behaviors of appreciation, communicating transparently, interest in ideas, interest in someone's career, inclusiveness? Is it one of those that you could do better? Do you want to start measuring leader index for your staff because it improves the speed of core, lowers rates of burnout? What could you do by next Tuesday? So the second piece for coherence is one of the most powerful for making a change in the levels of professional distress in a esprit de corps at your organization. It's this model we call ask, listen, empower, where we ask in a very psychologically safe environment, nurses, doctors, social workers, MAs, managers, what's working well in this unit, what brings you joy at work, what are the pebbles in your shoes? What are your frustrations? What doesn't work well? We listen. We listen to understand. And then together, we take the pebbles, the frustrations, the inefficiencies that we have control over at the unit level and start to address them. The ones we don't have control over at the unit level, we escalate to the leader above us and to the organization for them to deal with. But we address together, not doing it for them, but with them, the opportunities that they've identified as frustrations. And so we, we published these results. Basically, the, in the first 217 units that we worked with, before and after, the speed of core went up, teamwork went up, professional distress and burnout went down. And in our experience with these units, it went on 21% absolute change. Very similar work done by uh, Mark Linzer in a cluster randomized trial they basically have the same results, 21.8% reduction in burnout, which is a 3.1-fold higher rate of reduction of burnout compared to the control groups in that cluster randomized trial. It works. In all, it's not rocket science. We're asking, we're listening, and then we're empowering the team to address the issues that came up. Remember these old Nokia phones? They, if you surveyed people, um, over 90% of people who had a Nokia phone, which were the, the dominant market share on the planet a generation ago in the early days of cell phones, over 90% of them hated the ringtone. They hated the ringtone, but nobody changed it, even though you could change it on the old phones. That's what these pebbles are like. All of us have frustrations and things that bother us with team dynamics or leader dynamics or handoffs and inefficiencies. And we just live with them. And so this ask, listen, and power is an opportunity to say, what's frustrating you? You don't like that ringtone? Well, let's change the ringtone together. Here's an example from a KD hospital out in Utah in Intermountain Healthcare. One of the pebbles in their shoes were these, in the ICUs, were long ICU rounds. The average time you can see on this graph was seven and a half hours for them to make rounds to get through all the patients. Patients were frustrated, families were frustrated, nurses were frustrated, ICU docs, everybody. The, 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 it was material information they needed. Everything was non-standard. Long story short, within a handful of months, six months of work, they reduced that to about an hour and a half from seven and a half hours just by simply standardizing, asking each other what the best practices were, and they removed that pebble from their shoe and it made a difference. The ringtone that they were living with went away without any rocket science, without any Lean Six Sigma, without any new technology. It was simply people getting together and saying, how can we fix this together? So standard work is not a virtue in and of itself. We should create standard work when it creates value for patients and time for professionals. And that should be our litmus test for moving forward. There are thousands of things that we could standardize. We should work on where it improves the life of professionals and improves the life of patients 
before anything else. Deming taught us that bad process beats good people every day. And so this assless in power is about identifying bad process, Vulcan process, absence of process, and putting coherence back into the system where it has lost. So is there something you can do by next Tuesday? Can you ask your team about an opportunity to improve? Can you ask a team about the pebbles in their shoes and systematically start working on it? This works at large organizations and small organizations. And so the last of these three pieces uh, is camaraderie for creation of ideal work. And camaraderie relates to a learning organization, which uh, uh, P Peter Senge taught us about. He, in the long run, he tells us that the only sustainable source of competitive advantage for your hospital, your clinic, your medical center is its ability to learn. And learning happens when we have social capital, trust and interconnectedness of people, and that's camaraderie. Camaraderie is boundarylessness, it's teamwork, it's the trust and interconnectedness and social capital, and it's mutual respect. And so the tactic here that is evidence-based and validated uh, has to do with um, th this little picture. <laughs> you ever notice how when children uh, draw pictures that the people are so much bigger than the houses? And somewhere along the line, we lose the perspective that people are more important than things. And this camaraderie gets us back to what we knew as children. So commensality is a fancy word for sharing a meal with someone. And um, we've done three randomized control trials at Mayo with real doctors uh, on commensality. One of them, we measured cortisol levels before, after, and follow-up. Cortisol levels and stress hormone went down simply by sharing some time for a reflective, positive conversation with colleagues over some food. And so we offer uh, to pay for meals and food for any group of professionals that wants to get together and have a conversation because we know what makes a difference for them and for our patients. And so could you do something by next Tuesday? Could you set up a lunch with your, uh, with your colleagues or your team where you don't talk about business, you just talk about each other and life and what it's like to be a manager, a professional, or nurse, or doctor, or pharmacist? We know it makes a difference. It's investment in the social fabric of our organization. So the last piece of this, beyond the triad, is about our own well-being which we look at as the combination of wellness, contentment, and resilience. And it's everything from relationships and vacation to Mediterranean diets to moral code and flexibility. You know the, the list here. But it's then methodically looking at how we can improve. So the schema that we look at is the, the balance of these three factors. And so for optimal esprit de corps, for eradicating burnout, first of all, we want to decrease the depleting factors. So this is decreasing the negativity of your work environment, of your teams, of the leadership. The second piece is to increase the positivity. And that's what we spent time on with those intervention triad of agency, coherence, and camaraderie. And the third, then, of course, is growing our individual well-being by working on some aspects of wellness, contentment, and resilience. And, and so the optimal esprit de corps, where professional burnout is going away and being muted and mitigated, is by decreasing the depleting factors, increasing agency coherence camaraderie, the positivity, and improving our own well-being, which is the last piece of the puzzle. And this is called allostatic load, which is a fancy way of measuring 
the wear and tear and stresses on our human condition of stressful work conditions. And as we lower those allostatic load, we improve our well-being, we improve our esprit de corps, we actually improve our lifespan. People that work in jobs and careers where they have less control over their life, where it's more stressful, actually have a measurably higher rate of cancer, cardiovascular disease, musculoskeletal issues than people who have uh, a more friendly um, um, and positive and supportive uh, work environment. This is how I look at it. These are all the molecules of the allostatic load. In the middle is cortisol and uh, C-reactive protein. We want those to go down. And we want uh, endorphins and endocannabinoids and nitric oxide and glutamate and melatonin to go up. We want the right uh, levels of dopamine, serotonin, and um, dopamine, serotonin, and uh, oxytocin to all go in the right direction. And the three, the agency, coherence, and camaraderie, those actions, those tactics change these levels. If you have a meal with someone, your oxytocin levels go up. So the, the well-being piece is something that we should have control over, and it's our own role for getting there. What I do in my personal life to raise, to improve all of those molecules in the right direction is I wake up every morning and plan when am I going to get outside and exercise? Is there a chance where I get a little daylight during the day? Uh, I meditate for 15 minutes uh, every day that's possible. I go for a walk with my wife. I eat a plant-based diet predominantly. I exercise every day and um, then I light a candle for dinner every night, and before I go to sleep, I write or send via email a note of appreciation to someone. All of those affect the molecules I showed you and move us in the right direction, and it's something each of us can do. So by next Tuesday, is there one of those that you would like to do for yourself with sunlight? or exercise, or meditation, or commensality, or gratitude, or forgiveness. All of them make a difference, and is there one that you could start doing or do more consistently by next Tuesday? So this is about co-creation of ideal work. I shared with you these five tactics, ask, listen, empower, the pronoun test, job crafting, commensality, those five leader behaviors. They work. They work in role, and we've proven it with robust uh, um, research, peer-reviewed journals. Um, none of this is perfect. None of it is final. But we know today that these work, and we can all start doing something by next Tuesday to improve this. This is Michael Glenn. He taught me that. Um, the best way to succeed is to help others succeed. And basically, these, um, what I shared with you today, the spirit of it is helping someone else succeed so we can improve the care of patients. And I'll end with this slide. I love this uh, slide that I use with permission from uh, Chris Johns. It's an aerial photograph in the Sahara Desert of camels. And you wouldn't know they were camels unless you saw their shadows. Leaders matter. Leaders all have shadows. And our shadows reveal our character like they do for these camels. And more than anything else, it's critical that all of us as leaders and all of us listening today are, are leaders in important positions, whether you have a title or not. The video has to match the audio. What we say is important, what we say we're going to do has to be connected to our shadows so people see that connection. And what we do as leaders, the staff notices and, uh, and we make a difference through the five behaviors, through working with our staff and creating a wonderful work environment for our patients. So I want to thank you for your time and I hope this was helpful to you in some way to help you or your team 
reconnect with meaning in your work. Thank you. Well, Steve, that was uh, that was just fabulous. Uh, I um, uh, am so impressed with how you have uh, pulled this together, and uh, I, I think it just it just just wonderful. Uh, the question is now: you are putting this in detail uh, in a book that you'll be releasing, just so that those that are on the webinar are, are aware of that. When will that be released? So, just so that if we wanted to deep dive, that we would be able to do uh, do so. Thanks, Chuck. The, the uh, um the manuscript is at uh, Oxford University Press, and it's a Mayo Clinic book that we're publishing through Oxford. And um, the editors have a little more work to do, but it should be out uh, sometime in early fall, hopefully by September. Thank you. Great, great. Well, thank you. Now, what we'll do, uh, I'm going to go to Alicia first, and I have some questions and comments, but I'm going to go to her first, though. What I want to do is just make sure that you all respond to our national survey questions. And next uh, next month, we have, um, we'll have we uh, have Tom Vanderwalk addressing governance boards and serious adverse events. So I just want you to recognize that we'll use the survey to guide our next webinar, as we have with Steve, uh, with, with burnout. And uh, I'll just go through these quickly so we get them done, Steve and Alicia, and we'll come right back to you uh, and uh, Dan uh, for your comments and thoughts. Uh, so the first question is, I'm interested in your webinar, Working with Governance Boards After Serious Adverse Events, and the specific topics you have the opportunity to make a free text entry. Uh, the second uh, question is, I'm interested in another webinar on updating mortality reviews. And this would be by uh, Dr. Huddleston, Jean Huddleston, uh, and a number of the really critical clinical areas uh, uh, are covered, and we'll have other leaders that are involved in the collaborative doing that. And we'd like to also ask you to let us know what topics in mortality reviews. And this is the review of all deaths in order to improve um, the quality of care that we deliver and, uh, and with our, our caregivers as well. So uh, it, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just shift gears just for a minute back to uh, our, uh, our team here, and thank you so much, Steve. Um, we're really uh, honored to have uh, uh, Alicia Kowalski, uh, professor at the Department of uh, Anesthesiology and Perioperative Care at MD Anderson in Houston. Uh, she's also another national expert on burnout and professional wellness in healthcare. For over two decades, she served patients at uh, the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, where I had the honor of uh, doing my medical oncology and uh, just an, an amazing institution uh, generating just an terrific, terrific outcomes. She's a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine, as I said. Um, she has, uh, was the founder and chair of Burnout to Brilliance, a national CME symposium, and has been very actively involved in a number of programs uh, that she outline for us uh, before we had uh, uh, our uh, uh, started our formal presentation. Uh, so, Alicia, I'd like for you just to recap those because I thought they were terrific. Uh, and also, she did her undergraduate degree at Rice and her MD from uh, the University of Texas Health Science Center, uh, and she has been at MD Anderson uh, uh, throughout her career. So, Alicia, would love to have you just recap uh, your work in burnout quickly, and then comments and questions that you have of Steve, and then I'll go to Dan for it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And Steve, it's always great to hear your talks. I really enjoy them very much. It is true. I joke that MD Anderson raised me, um, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to give back. I founded the GME Wellness and Career Sustainability Committee here and flourished that for the first 18 months to get it on its feet before I turned it over to a colleague and now serve her in an, advisor, in an advisory position. I am also the clinical faculty lead to the Institutional CRUES Council, and CRUES is an acronym for Career Resiliency, Engagement, Wellbeing, and Sustainability. We have a council that reflects all communities of the institution, including fac clinical faculty, research faculty, uh, APPs, nursing, education, ombuds, and HR operations. So it's a privilege to re represent my colleagues in that role, and I hope to bring a lot of good progress and shifts with my work across the institution there. Additionally, the MD Anderson Texas Medical Center relationship is fortified through collaborative efforts 
for trainees. We have a committee that looks at uh, burnout and wellness professionally across the training community that serves the Texas Medical Center, and I serve as the MD Anderson representative to that. And then I represent MD Anderson to the University of Texas system-wide effort regarding professional wellness. And I want to thank you very much for bringing up Burnout to Brilliance. Uh, I feel very privileged to have founded and co-chair that along with Baylor College of Medicine. And it is a nationwide symposium where we have experts who contribute to the message of professional well-being in terms of mitigating impact and how to address it from an organization and institution aspect as well as personal resiliency. And um, our next symposium is in May, which we're very excited uh, with the upcoming date. Steve, I wanted to just ask you a few questions. Um, when you spoke about professional distress, I love that. I love the uh, umbrella that widens the horizon past the definition of burnout. And in terms of addressing it with participative management, do you have any suggestions for clinicians or faculty to engage their leaders in participative management? Well, thanks, Alicia. I think the, the, the best way to do this is to have it be part of the culture. And so it starts then at the very top of the organization where the CEO and the CNO and CMO, all of the senior leaders live this behavior of asking before telling or maybe never telling and, and seeking to understand and having decisions made by the team and not autocratically. And then, so it's not just for the front line. You can do this independently, but the ideal is to have be the whole culture of the organization so it's the spirit of team and participative management instead of autocracy where all the answers come chiseled on a tape, clay tablet telling doctors and nurses what to do. Yeah, I love that vision. I love that term. And I think that that is reflective of such a healthy uh, working climate and professional culture. Yeah, and, and you can measure it. So the leader index and the, and the if you ask, people close to the patients about that culture, you can measure it and you can see it improve or you can see it get worse. And, and there are ways to develop leaders and managers so that they can be better leaders for patients. Well, that leads me to the next question that I was going to ask you too, because I love the concept of the leader index. And what would be some ways that in my position on the council, I could help to shift the culture to incorporating the leader index? In our institution? I think that the spirit of any kind of measurement of leaders has to be that we, the, we want to help you be a better leader. So when you first start talking about that at many organizations, leaders maybe cross their arms and cross their legs and, and say, Are you, is this rack and stack? Are you looking to fire me? And you know, why do I need to be measured? Um, but if you, but it's best to start with a gentle, we want to make you a better leader, um, and we want to make you an inspirational leader, even more than you are. So we can't make each other be charismatic leaders, but for leaders who live those five behaviors, the staff sees them as inspirational. So the spirit is to help them do that. So I guess I, if I were looking to instill that or inculcate that into a organization, I would start by just talking about it and teaching it and having a few sessions and then moving then over time to a formal measurement of that where you could actually um, get some specific feedback to those leaders because we absolutely know it makes a difference and uh, um, for the, the culture, for burnout, for speed of core, and for patient outcome safety service. Sure, well, absolutely. It fosters a culture of um, psychological safety and trust more so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which I definitely just, leads Jeff, that's terrific. I, I, I want to give uh, Dan a chance to comment, and I'll come right back to you, Alicia. Dan, do, do you have any uh, uh, comment or a question for Steve or, or Alicia? And then we'll come back to you, Alicia. 
Uh, real quick, Chuck, and I'll make this as short as I can. Um, I, just taking a piece of, of what you said, Steve, in, in the concept of agency, um, I did executive search for 36 years. I've been a patient safety advocate for um, a handful of years now, 19 years, uh, volunteering that overlapped with my professional career. I interacted with a lot of execs, a lot of board members. I moved to, to Grand Rapids uh, seven years ago and I met with the CEO and I said, how can I help? Because I had undertaken this uh, voluntary patient safety advocacy. And uh, that led to the last four years, I've, I've been a member uh, of the uh, Spectrum Health uh, Quality and Safety uh, Committee as well as, all oh, the term just ended, a member of the executive PFAC. Um, there are 163, as of December, there were 163 patient PFAC, patient family advisory council advisors. I brought a very unique perspective given what I just described to you. Um, and every single one of the others brings their own perspectives in the same way. And I would say, using your term, uh, Steve, each of us had agency and we were expected to be independent thinkers not to come in and be an arm of the marketing department of Spectrum Health, but to be independent thinkers and to ask really straightforward questions, not to come in there deliberately to be critical and negative and all that. But my personal philosophy was always, how can I help? And that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do in that PFAC program is helping providers succeed. And I, I would encourage, Steve, as an aspect of your entire program to encourage providers in every way they can, any way they can, to involve a patient or family or two who, who, who are constructive inputters, who can also be constructive disruptors, with, with the whole idea being to help improve patient care, to prevent medical errors from happening. When medical errors happen, to help providers figure out how to constructively, constructively deal with it. Uh, Steve, you and Chuck both know about my longtime advocacy to invite the patient and family to participate in their RCA, and I won't get into that now. But to me, that is that relates to this entire program. It involves transparency, it involves speaking up, it involves accountability, um, it involves the culture, it involves respect. Um, and, and, and in summary, to add value by involving patients and families in many, many capacities. And I'll stop there, but just wanted to plant that. Thank, thank you, Deanne. As always, you yeah, that fabulous. I, I'm gonna, just watching the time here, and I want to get give Alicia and 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 Steve uh, uh, some some air time on 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 one topic that I just it jumps off the page to me. And and Steve, that is this the scientific approach that you that you both are taking to this issue that at first blush people would think oh burnout you know how could you how could you measure improvement and that kind of thing can you uh, can you both kind of respond to that I, it's so exciting to see that you you've done studies that there's now more evidence there that i think can really move the needle maybe out at the front line maybe and then alicia anything you want to add back to steve and then we'll have dan close maybe i'll take one kind of the first alicia i, I think in quality and in uh, professional stress, as we decor, it's very important that we do as robust a science as we can so that we can prove to people who might doubt that this makes a difference or we can more rapidly spread good things by saying this is decent science and we know that it makes a difference for outcome safety service patients or the well-being of staff. And if we don't, th then it's more likely to stall or sometimes we'll just make a mistake and something we think makes a difference actually doesn't. Um, so, um, so so we've done that uh, methodically in order to make sure that we can have the biggest impact locally and beyond that we possibly can for quality and for burnout. Great to see. Alicia, your thoughts on, on the science behind this that's evolving, so exciting. And then anything else you would like to add? Oh, well, thank you. Um, I'm interested, Steve, I, I really appreciate your reference to the study of the decrease in the cortisol with just breaking bread. And Absolutely. I wonder for our listeners, right, I wonder for our listeners if you could just elaborate some on 
how many interventions, how many dinners there were, over what period of time, the number of size of the participants, what the commitment is from the institution, in case any any people want to lobby for such a program. Sure, it's it's one of the you know very low cost programs we do. It's basically um, the the best group size is five to seven professionals that make a commitment to meet twice a month. Uh, give them a lot of agency. They can meet breakfast, lunch, dinner, hors d'oeuvres, um, breaks, whatever they want, and they can self-form the group. Uh, all we ask is that they start the conversation with one of 50 different topics about professionalism or a great coach or mentor or a great patient story or family story, and then, um, and then we reimburse uh, for their uh, meals with our uh, food and beverage policy. All three of the randomized control trials had uh, the groups met uh, twice a month uh, for you know some sort of uh, food, and it, you know that's the best kind of social science you can get is a randomized control trial. It makes a difference for them and for patients. We saw different not just the cortisol, but we saw differences in social isolation, positive feelings about the organization, emotional exhaustion. Everything went in the right direction in the intervention group. And the intervention was just a little bit of food and a little bit of conversation. That's terrific. That's a really um, innovative way to look at actually having a physiologic response to an intervention mm -hmm. in terms of the personal aspect as well as the interaction between the professional and the institution. So, And some of the teams were intact teams that had doctors, nurses, NPPAs, managers. Some of them were nephrologists. Some of them were um, you know, doctors in different specialties, like in the lung cancer space. So instead of telling someone, this is your team, you say, here's an opportunity, and give them the agency to take control of that. And self-form. And I love the networking across the different specialties, too, with a common bond. Yeah. yeah. You know, I could see, uh, uh, Alicia, I could see doing a broader study building on standing on the shoulders of what Mayo had done uh, to prove that it just isn't Mayo. Because frequently, uh, you know, having been done some extra training, it may have been a faculty there. And whenever we mention Mayo or we mention Anderson, we, you know, people say, oh, well, we're not them. But I mean, I really think that that is, that is so powerful. Well, I well, just want to thank every, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Alicia, please. No, no. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for that. Uh, I agree yeah. with you, and I think that there is a lot of opportunity to build on that. Great. Well, listen, what I'd like to do, I want to finish on time. We always promise to do so. And the agency, I, I, I'll close with just a, a, a quick a quick story about, about agency at Mayo and then ask uh, Dan to close us. And I just want to thank everyone for their attention and for uh, Dr. S uh, Swenson and Dr. Kowalski. But, um, Steve, if you remember when we shot the uh, one of the discovery films at the Mayo Clinic, uh, we interviewed uh, – the lady that cleans the toilets, that cleans the rooms, who, uh, whose name was Iris. And we interviewed her regarding uh, the work that was being done there. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. Uh, I asked her about the project where a fellow had come from Hormel Foods and brought the idea of measuring contact surfaces with a very inexpensive product that would allow you to uh, count colonies and identify where bacteria was. And they felt comfortable as a team. The cleaning team felt, it, felt the agency, the ability to use that device to then come up with a, 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 like a, a, an aviation checklist to clean the rooms, to clean where they had found uh, the bacteria count. And when I asked her uh, why they did it, she looked me right in the eye and she said, at the Mayo Clinic, the needs of the patient come first. And I thought, wow, that was the vision statement when I shared it with, uh, with your former CEO who's just retired, uh, John Noseworthy. I said, I'm really sorry, John, but the interview we did with you, I think we're going to repla we replaced in the film with Iris, and he was thrilled. It just kind of was a great example of agency and, and putting the caregiver at the front line first. Exactly. So she job crafted her, her work from being a custodian to saving lives by reducing infections. Amazing. Well, listen, thank you all. Dan, would you please close us? And again, Dan, thank you for inspiring us every time you're on a webinar. Appreciate it, uh, Chuck. Thank you.
Um, Luke 4.23 in the Bible says, basically says, physician, heal thyself. Commendable goal, something that, that we all, uh, beyond physicians, taken literally, we all ought to do. But the subject we're talking about today is, is basically really emphasizes the fact that this is really a team effort, a team effort in so many positive and constructive ways. Thank you, everybody, for listening and for participating, and have a great day. And if you're someplace cold, stay warm. Thank you all. God bless.